um, and we do strategic communications. So let me thank everyone for, um, for joining us today. Especially want to thank you, Congressman, the Honorable Jim Moran, for agreeing to moderate this panel. And uh, also thank the panelists, Dr. Marrera Godina and Mr. Ibrahim Aden, for agreeing to take part in this discussion. I'll be very brief, but as we all know, Ethiopia's stability is, is so important to the African, well, to Ethiopia and its people, to um, the African continent and indeed the rest of the world. We know that Ethiopia, the country of many of you on this panel, is going through a difficult period and we all mourn the, um, the tragic loss of life engendered by this, by this current conflict. Those of us here believe that Ethiopia's troubles must be solved through dialogue and democratic means and not through armed conflict. We hope that the forum will be a first step in initiating an Ethiopian national dialogue amongst Ethiopia's leaders aimed at bringing peace and prosperity to all Ethiopians. Let me just now introduce our moderator for today, uh, the Honorable Jim Moran. Jim, um, Jim represented Virginia's 8th Congressional District, if I got that right, Jim, from 1991 to 2015. You were known for your bipartisan leadership and ability to resolve complex issues. Um, indeed, you may not remember me, uh, Congressman, but I remember you well from the Foreign Affairs and Appropriations Committees when I had to go plead for United Nations funding and payment of UN dues in those days uh, back then. And you were always receptive, always committed to international cooperation. So we're really happy to have you with us. You serve on appropriations, foreign affairs, banking, housing and finance, and government reform and oversight committees. And I think if my notes here are right, you did 12 terms in Congress, so it's quite a record. So, so as a senior member um, of, of the Appropriations Committee, you were also chairman of various important subcommittees, all of which very um, relevant to our discussions today. And we're really happy to, um, to have you with us today. I think it's an honor, and you can give us the benefit of your experience as we take forward this first step in this Ethiopia Forum. So without more ado, let me hand the floor over to you, Congressman. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Stopford. Uh, I was always very impressed. I don't think I communicated that to you sufficiently when you were not just so articulate, but uh, so passionate about something that was so important. Uh, the United Nations is essential to the, uh, the peace and prosperity of the entire planet. Um, and in terms of the people that I represented, <clears throat> Uh, it, it's um, about 800,000 people. They live on the other side of the Potomac River from Washington, D.C. Uh, a lot of foreign service people, a lot of government employees, and a lot of government contractors, and of course, lobbyists. Um, it's uh, probably the, the uh, uh, best educated and the most affluent uh, uh, con the congressional district in the country, which means that I was probably uh, the, um, uh, the poorest and uh, the least intelligent of all my constituents, but somehow I managed for about a quarter century to represent them. Um, let me just put in a personal word because all politics is personal. And um, the reason I wanted to do this panel is because even though I've, uh, I've been to Ethiopia, but uh, obviously I'm hardly Ethiopian uh, don't have any blood connection, but I have a personal connection. Um, and it went back to when I was mayor of Alexandria, Virginia. And there was a gentleman at the, uh, at the booth when we would park in the garage. His name was Tedros. Uh, he wanted everybody to call him Ted. Uh, every time that I would see I him, he would have a stack of books next to him. And every time I would notice him when he wasn't taking in money or giving out uh, a ticket, whatever, he was studying. He had a passion to learn. And I found out that, uh, that he was Ethiopian. He had been pushed out while well, he had escaped from the Mengistu regime. I learned a little about that regime. One thing led to another. It turned out that there's a large Ethiopian community in Northern Virginia. Uh, it's a very significant diaspora, not just in terms of quantity, but in terms of the quality of the people. They make a big difference. 
uh, when I, in the Congress, um, uh, I got an earmark for an Ethiopian Economic Development Center in Arlington, Virginia. And um, those folks that were part of that community have prospered. All they needed was a chance. And one of the things that somebody told me that made the biggest difference, because I said, you know, I, I, gosh, I, I wish things were more stable and there was a stronger economic future for your country of origin. And they said the difference, the reason we do so well here is that we all find a way to get along. And in Ethiopia, we are still in that process of figuring out who belongs in the sandbox and who should have the most space and the most influence. And, and they, they told me that this is all about starting with getting to, uh, uh, getting to be part of a larger Ethiopian community, regardless of our tribe. So I don't know how accurate that was. It struck me as important. And I, I followed Ethiopia through the years and um, sometimes I, I've been just overjoyed when I've read the news. I read when in 1991, I was overjoyed. Uh, I thought when uh, uh, Abiy Ahmed uh, uh, took power and got the Peace Prize that this was a, a, a source of, of uh, uh, wonderful exhilaration for the future of Ethiopia. I'm not as confident anymore. I can't figure it out. And so this panel and this entire presentation that has been uh, put on for the broader diasporan and uh, community and those who are interested in Africa and, and, uh, and, and particularly in, well, in generally foreign policy, this is an opportunity for those of us who are, uh, are, are uh, the funnel, trying to figure out what the problem is. How can we get everyone to work together for the betterment of the uh, of the nation of Ethiopia? You've got to tell us. We need to learn from you. We need your insight. We need your reflection. We need your intellect, and most importantly, we need your spirit uh, to uh, contribute to uh, a, a, a happier, more prosperous. Uh, generations of uh, Ethiopians. So <clears throat> that's why I'm honored to be part of this. Uh, I've talked too long, but I just wanted to share that personal insight. So we have some experts with us. Uh, and um, uh, I, I want to kick it off if we could. Uh, the, the first topic of discussion, of course, is going to be the, the political and ethnic conflicts uh, that grip Ethiopia today, and what some possible solutions might be. Uh, so uh, I'd like to ask, because we've gotten some, uh, some very good questions uh, suggested. Uh, the, the first question is, uh, what is the general position of the party that you represent? Uh, we have uh, panelists that uh, uh, are going to answer that. Uh, Dr. Marera Gudina uh, of the uh, Oromo Federalist Congress. And if I pronounce something wrong, catch me right away because uh, uh, it's my fault and, uh, and I apologize in advance. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Mr. Ibrahim Aden of the uh, Ogaden National Liberation Front. And then we're going to have uh, a, a, a couple of people who uh, are going to ask additional questions. Uh, Ms. Sina Jimjimo, uh, that's actually a very nice name, Jimjimo, and Ms. Hoden <laughs> uh are, are also going to contribute. So uh, let's start, uh, if we could, uh, with Dr. Gudina. Uh, tell us what your solution would be if. If you were sitting up there in, in the vast universe looking down on Ethiopia, what would you want the people of Ethiopia to do, particularly the people that you have the most influence over, Doctor? You're on you, mute. I think you're on mute right now. And it's, it looks as though you're on mute, if you could. Uh, 
By the way, Congressman, excellent introduction, an inspiring introduction. Thank you. Uh, it's nice of you to say, Michael. I, what I, about now? There we go. Good. What about excellent. now? Excellent. Okay. okay. Uh, you know, if you know uh, Cuban history, uh, the problem is since the days of the emperors, uh, we had three regimes, uh, what we call the imperial regime. Uh, which uh, was uh, overthrown in, 19, in 1974, very disastrously led to a very bloody military interlude. In fact, under the guise of socialism, uh, a cream of one generation was uh, totally destroyed and uh, decimated. And then we had um, another uh, equally very uh, <laughs> equally authoritarian regime, that is uh, the EPIDF regime, which uh, using uh, the ideology of uh, revolutionary democracy. Uh, in reality, it is neither revolutionary nor democratic, but the misnomer over there. Uh, this regime also for the last 27 years or so, consistently uh, you know, narrowed um, the political space, um, thousands and thousands of uh, different Ethiopian communities um, uh, either detained, uh, even killed, um, and, and a lot of other lot of problems, and uh, this regime um, frustrated any movement towards uh, national dialogue, towards a common, uh, um, a common understanding of appreciation of our problems, and also a common, uh, uh, a common understanding in the solutions to the future of this country. Uh, historically, we had the mar marginalization of different European communities. That one way or another, that continue uh, under the, that regime. And the problem is the present regime also uh, uh, trying to do the same. It is using the legacy of uh, this revolutionary democracy, probably brought up, since the leaders are brought up and uh, grew under that regime. And uh, they are frustrating, uh, probably in political science, what we call, uh, they are enjoying this zero sum game politics, either get all or lose all. Uh, therefore, our problem is really now uh, is a problem of really engaging, engaging uh, different Ethiopian communities, especially the political elite, uh, in a real national dialogue that uh, that can set a common roadmap for the future of this country and the peoples of this country. And uh, the present regime, to me, is frustrating that uh, type of uh, national dialogue, and in fact, using the old model. Uh, um, to uh, detain, uh, to, to narrow down the political space, to mess up. And in fact, that is uh, largely the problem what we are facing the conflict in the North. I think uh, a magic forum now, if we, we get one, is really leading this country in a way that we engage in a national dialogue that can address our historical, historical problems, marginalization of the bar, Past of different Ethiopian communities, also are trying to understand and draw a common, a common roadmap for the future of this country. So, what we are really, if I have a chance, uh, what I should do, and uh, really have been uh, crying for uh, as a political scientist or as a uh, as a political leader or at whatever, is we need a national dialogue. We really need a national dialogue, Ethiopia. And the Ethiopian regime, especially the Ethiopian regime, is at war with its own citizens, killing its own citizens, detaining its own its own citizens, but trying to marginalize, push away major political forces who could really contribute for the peace of this country. So we need three, three things. First, durable peace. And we get through with from the coming election, durable peace. For the last 50 years, five or half a century, Ethiopia has been so you know going undergoing from one crisis to another crisis to another crisis. So that should be stopped. And the way to stop that is one really to engage a national dialogue to create to find durable peace. The second one is especially what we expect from the coming election. If we are succeeding in the national dialogue, is can democratic Ethiopia can be born out of this? Exercise. We had several elections during the time of the emperor, during the military regime, uh, during um, the EPRDF, uh, EPRDF, EPRDF regime. 
In fact, I was a member of parliament from 2005 to 2010. But the problem is all these elections were false elections, pseudo elections, what we call in political science, really using what with elections to make authoritarian regimes stay in power by cheating the citizens in the international community. In fact, most of the elections to show to you the international community that it will be a sort of holding elections. And in fact, your Obama also came uh, uh, and they said once uh, you have a democratic elected election, why in the Ethiopia people were crying, why, why the leader of a big nation is coming and uh, making that type of uh, statement. So if we have a chance, really the first thing is real national dialogue to make the Ethiopian people peace at themselves, peace with their government and the peace with themselves is true. And that by doing that, create a stable, society, a uh, durable peace. By doing that also, and uh, at least approaching and uh, making sure that democratic Ethiopia is born and uh, leaving the historical imperial days, leaving the so failed socialist experience, leaving the revolutionary democracy, failed federalism. So we, we should, uh, I, I think what our party and also uh, myself is what we are looking for is to making our politics right, to make our politics right. If we make our politics right, I think we can able to address other fundamental basic issues of the country, such as problems of economic development and other things. Very good. Thank you, doctor. That sounds uh, very insightful. Uh, the uh, uh, durability uh, through dialogue and full democratic participation. If I could use three Ds just to keep them in my mind, um, it, um, it, it, it does sound like a formula for, uh, uh, for the kind of stability that you would like to see in the country. Let's hear from uh, Mr. Ibrahim uh, Aden. Um, and so I'm gonna mention, I, uh, those of you who were on earlier, I, I mentioned a young man who was working in a parking garage, the first Ethiopian person I got to meet. Uh, he's, um, I, I guess I should have mentioned that I'm told he's now a multimillionaire uh, and uh, he owns lots of parking garages. Uh, and um, uh, I kind of think of the 100 million people in Ethiopia, there's, uh, there's gotta be 50 million of them half of them women who could be equally successful if given an opportunity. And that's what we're talking about. Now, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Aden's uh, byline here, it says Ibro Ade. Uh, I think he'd rather not be called Ibro Ade for the rest of his life because his parents named him Ibrahim Aden. Uh, so uh, uh, we, uh, I wanna turn to him. I mentioned the gentleman that I talked about earlier because uh, Ibrahim, you actually look quite like him. Uh, with the same uh, intellect. And we're gonna get to the two women uh, uh, quite uh, quite early. I, I've been at so many dinners where the men take up all the time and then we get to dessert and then women speak up and all of a sudden we realize, oh gosh, that's what we really should have been talking about. So uh, the, uh, <laughs> we'll give you an opportunity. But at this point, Ibrahim, uh, if you would share with us your insight along the same lines of uh, how Dr. Uh, Goudin addressed the question. Thank you. Um, on behalf of the Ogaden uh, National Liberation Front, ONLF, I'm greatly honored and delighted to be part of this panel presenting the Somali people in Ogaden region. I would like to thank the organizers of this outstanding panel and uh, foremost, my special gratitude uh, to former Congressman Jim Moran uh, uh, moderating this panel. Uh, before I shed, uh, before I share the ONLF views regarding the causes of the Ethiopian conflict, I would like to briefly shed some light on the Ethiopian history to better understand how Ethiopia was initially formed and the culture of the consecutive Ethiopian government. Ethiopia was an empire state that was forcefully, forcefully formed by one nation, namely the Amhara, conquering by force or by support of the other nations, the Amhara nation dominated the Ethiopia for almost a century. 
and liberation wars and international strife never stopped. Amhara um, domination started to weaken after the World War II due to some factors. One of the main factors was the, uh, the extremely autocratic uh, unjust system that favored a few and marginalized the rest created discontent after the idea of self, uh, self-determination and the wind of liberation swept the world, especially Africa. Some nations like Somalia, Eritrea, and Oromo sought independence. For example, Somalis who had their uh, brethren across uh, borders managing better than, the, uh, than they started demanding more rights. And after their grievances were not addressed, started liberation wars that had domino effect in influencing these uh, Eritreans and Oromos, and later the Chireans. Uh, after Mengistu and his Dergi army junta were finally defeated by Eritrea and TPLF and, the, and other liberation for, uh, forces, TPLF and the Tigrayans replaced the Amhara domin- dominant nation. TPLF initially drew a jar- charter and promised a fundamental change that allowed all nations to exercise their self determinations up to secession. This moral shift gave hope to all nations, and for the first year, there was optimism and hope. First, it created an ex- exclusive alliance of four pa- parties. The other remaining parties that it felt would threat to its power and domination were systematically sidelined and the major ones that TPLF felt would threat were eliminated one by one uh, after they considered the power. In addition, in addition uh, many Amhara intellectuals with ties to previous regimes and strong parties were eliminated through targeting killing and arbitrary detentions. The OLF was targeted and eliminated. Finally, ONLF, the Ogaden National Liberation Front, which won the election in the Somali state and was not submissive to the TPLF, was eliminated. While performing all these undemocratic practices, TPLF rhetoric was very uh, democratic and progress, and it, it duped the international community and many citizens. It even went further and propagated one of the most liberal and democratic constitutions, including human rights, uh, provisioning democratic rights, and rights of nations to uh, self-determination. But that was only on paper, not on practical. That is the key point. I mean, TPLF put the most liberal uh, constitutions, well-written, but it was only on paper. It has never been a practical. It was just a fiction, in other words. So um, coming back, uh, to the issues that aggravated the situation in Ethiopia and the ONLF views, uh, the culture of the violence to resolve differences, both at state level, people level, and other stakeholders, the attitude that the government owns the people. I mean, this has become an issue for, for Ethiopian people. I mean, the government has the attitude of owning the people instead of people owning the government. This is where uh, a democratic world uh, says a government elected by the people for the people. But in other words, Ethiopia, it's a government elected by the government for the government. The idea that some uh, are more superior than others, that they are the guardians of Ethiopia and are responsible for its unity and sovereignty, and the rest are just bandages, that they patronize and discourse of how to build uh, and shared future and inclusive nations. The perception that says the ills of Ethiopia started with the nation's based federal system, and if that's eliminated, that Ethiopia will be united, stable, and peaceful is not true. The Ethiopian constitutions and the current federal system are not the major causes of the permanent conflict in Ethiopia. It is the nature of the whole system of Ethiopia state, where the rule of law is a fiction, not functional. Human rights are only available for the ruling elites. National resources, businesses, and government positions are exclusively preserved for the main ruling nation and the left overs are for the stooges, stooge allies, not a union allies are possible. So in summary, Ethiopia have never truly practiced democracy and independent judiciary allowing for the rule of law to prevail. While the current government has taken steps to start down the path for realizing of realizing a democratic society, this journey is far from over. Democracy and rule of law 
have not filtered down to the regional states. This means while some major national level reforms have been taken place, the people at the regional, district, and village levels are not experiencing the democracy and are still subject to gross violations of human and civil rights. The absence of justice always results in conflict. The ONLF, as an independent political party representing the vast majority of Somali in Ethiopia, which occupies the second largest land mass and are the third largest ethnic group in terms of population, believes that a national level dialogue will, will, uh, with all stakeholders present is critical at this time to ensure the legitimacy of the upcoming election in June and chart a way forward to jointly strengthen and establish when necessary the institutions that sustain a functioning democracy and rule of law. It is this absence of a national stakeholders dialogue approach that fuels conflict and tension which severely impact marginalized communities like the Somalis. With those few remarks, I turn them back to yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Aiden. I, I think I should call you doctor because with that kind of uh, articulation and thoughtfulness, you must have some kind of advanced degree, I'm sure. But uh, I, I appreciate all that preparation uh, and insight that you put into uh, your statement. Uh, it was comprehensive. It covered a lot of the issues that we want to subsequently cover as uh, was Dr. Goudinas. Uh, so uh, I'd like to move on to one of the vexing issues. It's kind of like a, a cloud over all of these political discussions. Um, uh, as noted by the late uh, Professor uh, uh, Alam Habtu in his uh, research for the Center for African Development Policy Research at Western Michigan University, in 1991, Ethiopia established an ethnic federal system that gave full recognition to ethnic autonomy while maintaining the unity of the state. Normally, those are two tensions that are difficult to resolve. We found that in, in Yugoslavia. Uh, we found that in, uh, in Iraq and so many countries. Uh, the new Ethiopian constitution, though, perhaps for expedient reasons, created a federal system largely consisting of ethnic-based territorial units. The constitution aspires to achieve ethnic autonomy and equality while maintaining the Ethiopian federal state. The Ethiopian federal system is significant in that the Ethiopian constitution provides for the secession of any ethnic unit. It encourages political parties to organize along ethnic lines and champions a federal state with a secession option. I can only imagine if that was in the US constitution, what the consequences would have been. There is agreement among some Ethiopians and Westerners that Ethiopia's ethnic federalism has increased ethnic conflicts in Ethiopia. According to Professor Mahmoud Mamdani, uh, who is a uh, distinguished professor at Columbia University, ethnic, federational, ethnic federalism unleashed a struggle for supremacy among the big three, the Tigray, the Amhara, and the Oromo. Professor Mamdani states that the reforms being pushed by Prime Minister Abe are clashing with Ethiopia's flawed constitution and could push the country toward an inter-ethnic conflict. Professor Mamdani concludes by stating that Prime Minister Abe can achieve real progress if Ethiopia embraces a different kind of federation that is territorial and not ethnic. So I want to throw, uh, ask you to address this question. Are the opponents of the current Ethiopian constitution and ethnic federal system correct in their conclusion that the ethnic federal system has resulted in increased tribal conflict in Ethiopia. And uh, obviously we wanna know where your party stands because you're representing your party uh, as it applies to the Ethiopian constitution and the federal system that we have now. 
And uh, is there any con consideration of secession uh, as a result of the consequences of the upcoming election? So uh, let's turn first to Mr. Aiden, and then we'll turn to Dr. Gudina this time. Uh, thank you. Mr. Aiden? Yes, thanks again. Uh, in short, I say no. I say no, uh, they're not correct. The single most dangerous thing that can happen in Ethiopia today is to abandon ethnic federalism and drop the constitution. If this approach had any home, Ethiopia would have had democracy long ago. I say this because Ethiopia has been ruled many governments, uh, central governments, I should say, and none of those governments achieved democracy democracy in the past through uh, uh, central government. Uh, it was the TPLF in 1991 that led uh, the first cent uh, decentralized government, uh, even though they had their own uh, challenges and issues that they caused. Um, but again, in, in short, that is not correct. The problem in Ethiopia is that the constitution was not taken seriously and the rights under the constitution were denied completely. The right to self-determination existed on paper only, not in practical. This is again a flaw assertion loaded with a special interest from certain uh, quarters. The center has always dominated and marginalized the rest. After a bloody struggle, the nations achieved measure of self-rule in theory TPLF mishandled ethnic federalism. If a driver throws the best car over the bridge due to carelessness, will you blame the car or the driver? TPLF drove multinational ethnic federalism in a way that gave them total domination of all resources in Ethiopia. In order to do that, they had to create a stooge entities and use inhuman practices in, other, uh, in order to control those entities the federal stru structure or constitutions are as good as they are put into practice. The current massacre and ethnic violence are beyond ethnic federalism issues. They are more related to historic injustice and grievances that were never addressed and different uh, groups that want to gain control through encouraging ethnic violence. It happens everywhere. You can see it in Burma, India, even in some major developed democracy where a nationalism is used to incite violence in order to win elections. So my point here is ethnic federalism was never an issue. It's only that the government that never uh, uh, put that into practical. So there was always uh, a regime in power saying ethnic federalism on purpose, but not truly practicing. If Ethiopia was given a chance to truly practice ethnic federalism, I think it would have prospered and be at better position than it is today. Uh, and I advise the current administration, Dr. B, to truly look into that and address this concern because we have seen Ethiopia has tested the flavor of central government, where only the power was dominated by uh, by, by the by the by the regime at that moment. Then later in 1991, they have seen the TPLF just in words or in paper putting, uh, stating that there will be a, a decentralized government, a of rule government and federal government, but all those were just not impractical. It was just fiction, not functioning. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ibrahim Aden. I keep pronoun pronouncing that name so that people will remember the name instead of what's on your picture. Let me just throw something out just to uh, be a little provocative uh, here and give you a couple moments more to uh, address the question, Dr. Godina. Uh, I, I was recently reading a very comprehensive study that was done uh, to address the question of why is Northern Europe so much more economically prosperous than Africa? Why is North America so much advanced beyond South America? 
A lot of theories have been put up in the United States were wrestling with white nationalism and so on. And the conclusion of this research was that it, in Northern Europe, there was the intermarriage of different tribes. And it was that uh, mixture, if you will, of, of different religious viewpoints, uh, different cultures, different views of the world, uh, that led to the kind of social integration that resulted in uh, a, a, much, uh, a, a much more aggressive economic expansion. Uh, and and uh, you know the, uh, the, the, the principles of the enlightenment and so on. And they, can, they applied it to the United States, North America, and they said that um, the, the, uh, the same thing is applying in the United States because the United States is an amalgam. It's a nation of immigrants. Unfortunately, we suppressed, repressed, and really committed almost ethnic genocide against Native Americans, uh, the, uh, the so-called Indians, but, um, but it is that integration that is ultimately going to be our mainstay in terms of uh, the social and, and, and economic stability. I'm just sharing that, and I, of course, I'm paraphrasing the results of the study, uh, 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 but uh, it's, it's interesting because Ethiopia is trying something different to uh, enable the various ethnic uh, groups to be able to have their own autonomy, but also contribute to a federalist state. So Dr. Godina, if, if you would share your insight into the Ethiopian experiment in democracy here, and whether you think it's in the right direction, what your party is going to do as a consequence of whatever the electoral results are coming up, et cetera. So Dr. Godina. Uh, you're on mute though. We really want to hear you, Dr. Godina, and you're on mute. Bob Miller, I go on mute. And then there we go. Okay, very good. Okay. Uh, you, uh, you know, but the starting from a more general one, uh, you know, I, a person called uh, Ali Mazuri is not uh, a keen and known, a very known political scientist. He was saying how Japan was able to westernize without giving a, her, up her culture and how Africa failed to do that. And uh, in, in many ways, I, I think that is a, the problems of underdevelopment takes are, are long and uh, don't have good indul indulgence that. You know, the question of cessation, from the beginning we say no. The question of autonomy without real autonomy in Ethiopia is really what uh, we, Ethiopia's uh, future could be to be, really, to sum up, Yugoslavia's uh, future, really, Yugoslavia's future, it is because of the Serb nationalism that Yugoslavia was destroyed. Uh, I think uh, <laughs> some of the people in Ethiopia who are saying uh, that, um, well, ethnic nationalism, doing that, and doing this, I think we understand the problem of ethnic, ethnic nationalism especially the problem is the problem of domination. Uh, what the structure of the, the EPRF tried is really, without democratizing it, it simply creates the structure, uses that, that the structure for its own monopoly of power. But uh, in the case, you know, ethnic nationalism, the problem of ethnicity or nationalism, the problem of, uh, uh, you know, marginalization, especially the problem of historical mar marginalization, as the Somali friend, uh, our fro fro Somali colleague has been saying, it is historical, the formation of the Ethiopian state. The Ethiopian state was created on an equal basis. There were uh, privileged classes and uh, groups who used Ethiopia for centuries, <laughs> you know, to benefit, to whatever, uh, all kinds of things. In fact, if you read, um, it's a very good book, uh, written by a professor, a Greek professor called um, John Markakis, who has been writing on Ethiopia since the days of the emperor. He, he was saying, uh, in fact, he said that to give that book, pass that book to the present prime minister. I think I sent to him. I hope, uh, I don't know whether he read it, but I passed to him. 
uh, he said in that book, he, Ethiopia, uh, the last two frontiers, he was summing up a real historic, giving a real historical summary that one, imperial Ethiopia or the imperial model has failed. The socialist model has failed. The federal model has failed. So what is the next? It is a question of genuinely all Ethiopian communities, all Ethiopian scholars, elites, come to a middle road to create a new Ethiopia on a new social, social contract basis. Otherwise, you know, one group trying to dominate using any kind of whatever is very difficult. Uh, by the way, I know uh, Professor Alamabtu probably we belong to the same, uh, whatever, all the socialist school. Uh, and also, also I met at least twice uh, Professor Mamadani. Mamadani probably, probably with his Indian background, whatever, in Uganda. Uh, in fact, one said the Ethiopian, the Ethiopian um, people for the Tigran elite is trying to copy what the British colonialist uh, somehow manufactured in British colonial school, <laughs> as Ethiopian experience. But whatever the way, I think any society should be able to create its own political structure, its own political a system, it is own political whatever. Otherwise, if we don't agree on that, anybody is trying to create this type of system, that type of system, and using that system to stay in power, that is a problem. That is what the, the emperor did. Uh, in fact, at the end of the day, found himself under the toilet, toilet of his own soldiers. He was uh, killed and buried under uh, Mangistu's uh, uh, toilet, you know, you know that. Uh, what that is why uh, Malas in his group uh, uh, have been trying uh, uh, in the, the military regime, le little leaders have been trying to stay rotted. They rotted for 20 years uh, where they lost power in, in prison. So I think uh, the Ethiopian problem is really the problem of the elite, what we call clashes of dreams. Probably people with the nostalgia of the imperial days are with us. I have, I have a lot of friends in the US, in, especially in the US trying to dictate that uh, uh, really uh, uh, non-ethnic federalism is the only way out. For example, our party, which I belong in um, the larger coalition, I also a chairman of the larger coalition called the uh, Ethiopian Democratic Unity uh, um, uh, Forum. What you are trying to do is to balance between the two, uh, whatever best systems from uh, individual rights that we can achieve to protect both rights together. Uh, probably the, like the Canadians, the Swiss, or the Belgians, or to some extent the Indians, trying to balance both individual rights and group rights, both together, should be protected under the same, the same system. If we st started to solve some of these problems now by trying to move to the middle road from both sides, not my way or the highway, but some, some sort of the middle Ethiopia way, uh, which a political structure that could accommodate all diverse voices in Ethiopia. For example, the people they are trying to marginalize, take the Oromos, the country's largest region, uh, large, uh, largest population, occupying probably the heartland of Ethiopia, from the Kenyan border to uh, the Amara region, to Gray region, to Djibouti, to whatever, the Somalia region. As a third largest group, the Somali group. Uh, having um, uh, whatever association, as uh, our colleague said, across the Ethiopian border. So there are major groups in Ethiopia that want a democratized federalism based on identity. There are a lot of experiences. And, you know, in 20 years' time, 30 years' time, probably in, in the next generation, we can negotiate, try to negotiate and create whatever system we have. But for now, for example, trying to take back the ethnic whatever, some sort of the structure. I think it is declaring war on people like the Somalia region, people like the Oromia region, in much of the South, already a war is declared in Tigray. So a lot of problems, you know. I think there a, a good component of say, people as one way or another associated with imperial past, I repeat it, imperial past, uh, with the nostalgia of the imperial past, they won't prefer once some sort of uh, whatever federalism based on the regions or regional whatever, economic or regional what, 
regard. So that can be achieved in probably our children 20, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. You know, the equation of nationality, the equation of historical marginalization, the equation of you know one identity trying to destroy other identities. It started before the TPL. I remember I, at that time I was in high school. The first question, the first literature, the first article or national question was written during the time of the emperor in 1969. The first question was, who is an Ethiopian? Who is an Ethiopian? That question was asked in 1951 years ago. Since that time, we could not un answer properly properly or in a way that it can satisfy all at least the major communities in the country. We are undergoing, you know, from one crisis to through another crisis to another crisis. I think, um, as in fact, publicly, I warned the prime minister not uh, to lose his own balance, uh, the trying to, you know, go with the nostalgia of the imperial days. You know, some of the problems is really the, the prime minister trying to go with uh, people behind whatever this imperial days that he, he ended in a very serious crisis, not only in a very serious crisis, even alienated his own constituency. That is the larger Oromo group. Now he's at war, uh, at war with Oromo political movements, at war, at war in the Oromo uh, people at large, and also major massive violations of human rights across Oromia, across a lot of uh, other regions. Not only in Tigray, people are missing. The, national, you know, the issue is not limited to the conflict in Tigray. Uh, the merger by my, in much of the country, serious conflicts, big or small, including a mess up in the country's largest group, such as Romania, or the third largest group, such as the Guardian in the South. So I, I think uh, some of the issue, issues are clear. The only way I think is we are not going for secession, but uh, we are going for real autonomy where different Ethiopian communities can rule themselves at the same time also can share power at the center. Otherwise, uh, whatever language you use or whatever such Chikachi Western uh, democracy, uh, anyway, democracy cannot be imported or exported, uh, trying to use that and try to dominate, uh, you know, uh, other communities who have a real concern, a real problem, historical marginalization, you cannot solve the problems. So we are really, we am calling, or our party is calling, we are not alone. We are working with uh, more, not less than uh, nine, uh, nine, 10 groups, including the uh, uh, ONLF, uh, Ogade National Liberation Front, uh, and the many other groups, uh, ONLF and others. So what you are trying is to really, to bring together the Ethiopian ending to a common middle road, middle way, uh, so that we can address the future in a more proper, balanced, whatever the way. I think the prime minister, I'm always telling him, he, he lost his balance. That is why is a part of the crisis in, in the country, including what is going on in Tigray, is because of that. It, it, it really, Ethiopia is a country of more than 110 million, a country of eight, the 80, more than 80 ethnic groups, different uh, with, uh, with different background, history, culture, and the demands, needs, interest. So the Ethiopian, the future of Ethiopia cannot be determined, I repeat it, cannot be determined by one group, ruling group, whatever, with nostalgia of the past. That is declaration of another declaration, declaration of war with many Ethiopian major groups including the country, country's major ethnic components. So uh, whatever uh, uh, Professor Alam uh, Abdul said or Muhammad Ali said, I think Ethiopians, especially the Ethiopian elite should come together and um, try to really push forward the common middle way, not uh, the, the imperialist nostalgia, people of the imperialist nostalgia, nostalgia highway, or probably those of us who are trying to push the ethnic agenda to a certain degree. I think national reconciliation is really needed, really needed uh, to avert the conflict, to create a future democratic Ethiopia, which could house equally all of us, 
not only one group or whatever. Uh, that is where we are. That is what we are trying to work on. But I think um, the, the present regime or the lead leadership, because it came out of the EPRF itself, because they were educated and brought up to that school, they are still uh, with that legacy of dominate, political domination uh, frustrating this uh, national dialogue. I think that is where uh, our party is uh, with our partners uh, in the game. Okay, thank you for sharing your insight and your uh, your passion, Dr. Godina. Um, it, it and and the historical perspective. I, <clears throat> I, I keep being the problems of the 21st century in many countries appear to be so similar to the problems of the 20th century and even of the 19th century. We keep repeating them. Santayana uh, had a famous um, observation that if we don't learn from the, if we don't learn the lessons of history, we're doomed to repeat the failures of history. That the big difference between the 21st century and the 20th century should be uh, that we have so many uh, examples to learn from what worked, what didn't. And uh, plus the fact that we now have the ability through telecommunications for leaders to <clears throat> acquire power through the value of their ideas uh, even more than the power of their political base through the, uh, through the means of, uh, of communication, advanced communication. So uh, all of this is, uh, is fascinating. I, I think I'm gonna apply this to myself too. Uh, we're gonna start being more succinct because on my screen, I can see these, uh, these uh, two highly intelligent people at the, at the top of the screen who happen to be women. And I do wanna give them an opportunity to speak as well. But before we do that, we've got to address uh, the conflict in Tigray, which uh, I assume I'm pronouncing that properly, uh, that, is what we read about. When we pick up an article in the Post or the New York Times or the Economist, it, it's it's the conflict in Tigray that's, that uh, is being focused on. And, and uh, Prime Minister Abe has, uh, seems to have lost much of his international support uh, because of the suppression of violence. So let me just say, with reaching out to experts, we received a question from Alex DeWall who is the executive director of the World Peace Foundation at the uh, School of Public Diplomacy at Tufts University, a very fine university, regarding a, the, a recent conversation that he had with Muligeta uh, 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 Je Jebrolot, I'm not pronouncing it properly, somebody else is gonna pronounce it better, he, but he's a member of the Tigray People's Liberation Front from 1975 to 1991, and the founder of the Institute for Peace and Security Studies at Addis Ababa. Muligeta is currently in Ethiopia and offered uh, a, a suggestion that there really needs to be international intervention in Tigray from the United Nations Security Forces, uh, akin to the UN intervention that uh, took place in Kosovo uh, and relatively uh, successfully, although Kosovo never, never had the natural or even human resources to be all that uh, self-sufficient. So I want to ask, and, and, and I think this is probably the last question we'll ask before we get into a more general discussion. We want to know how would your respective political parties uh, respond to Miligeta's call for UN security intervention in Tigray uh, 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 how is the conflict in Tigray and with the TPLF uh, 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 going to affect the future of Ethiopia? Uh, uh, what will uh, happen uh, uh, if uh, Prime Minister Abe's uh, war against the TPLF is successful? Can it ever be successful? Is it possible to suppress the insurrection uh, that uh, uh, is occurring in, in, uh, uh, in Tigray. 
and um, uh, is, it, is it really possible that it's going to go away without some substantial accommodation? I, I think that's his question. I, I'm going to leave this part of the panel to a response to that question. So, uh, and, and let's perhaps limit our response to anywhere from, uh, from three to five minutes, if we could. Uh, so let, let's go to Dr. Godina. Now you need to get off mute, doctor. You're, you're on mute again. That's a yes. spirit. Yeah, uh, I did not hear some of, did not hear some of what you said. Anyway, uh, I heard the Mulugeta's call. In fact, I know him. He, he is one of uh, the one of the most sensitive people I've met. He was part of the people that did it, and uh, later. Uh, Designed in the agenda of the university. Uh, calling, at least as an opposition, calling the intervention of the United Nations for the, uh, it's difficult for us or for me or for my, uh, my party. Uh, we, have, we, have, we have also a counterparty Tigra, a political group called Arana uh, Tigra, uh, working with Tigra. Uh, uh, sometimes we should consult each other people making this statement. Uh, I know we'll get up, uh, uh, I think if, even if it is very difficult uh, to call for the United Nations uh, intervention in a military way, uh, I think the United, United Nations in the Americans too, the Europeans at time, should one way or another address the humanitarian crisis. Uh, in fact, we just uh, put the statement out uh, by the, the larger coalition um, called the Madrid, which I chair, uh, calling for the human, you know, one or another, calling the, on the Turkish government to address uh, the international the humanitarian crisis, to give access to the international community, uh, to help uh, the civilian population. Uh, uh, from the information we are getting, really, uh, uh, it is uh, some of the, what we get is very shocking, really shocking. So there's a local population, the civilian population, millions, not only few, but millions, probably three quarters, more than three quarters of the Tigran population have been affected. So especially the, on the humanitarian ground, one or another, both the United States and the United, United Nations system, what should we try to address, push the, the Turkish government to address the humanitarian crisis. It is real. Uh, millions, uh, millions, or at least 100,000 are starved today, it's the way it goes. So uh, uh, that should, the humanitarian, humanitarian question uh, should be addressed. In fact, our party also called the, uh, the Turkish government not to escalate the war and to stop, to stop the war and to try to negotiate. Uh, in fact, uh, the government side did not like it, but even at the beginning of the war, when it broke out, we, we told them it, it, only, it is only the peaceful way of solving things that can save lives, can address the give us the chance to address the outstanding political issues, and so on and so forth. Uh, I think they, they did not hear us, and they don't, did not want to listen to us. Um, therefore, I think uh, even it's very difficult to us to call for a military intervention. I think the humanity addresses the, addressing the humanitarian issue or the humanitarian intervention one way or another, pushing the Turkish government to open up the larger large Tigray region, especially to help out the civilian, civilian population is very critical. Uh, it's uh, okay. really uh, that level. Uh, the other thing is, uh, uh, I think why they went to war with the president, it's more of a power struggle within the Ethiopia. Uh, the Tigra, the people, the Tigra equation going for dominating the whole political structure. Now the junior or middle level or junior partners in that now uh, they thought it is their time, you know, to punish their own masters. <laughs> I think uh, the power is uh, the show of as, as I told earlier, mismanage the transition, mismanage the transition. And the trying to do it, failing to make the transition all inclusive, uh, and that they try to think within the APRF box, in fact, certainly the APRF 
one wing of the EPA the package the other. Anyway, I think uh, uh, one way or another, really, it is time that the international community will address the humanitarian, humanitarian crisis uh, to save us from further conflict, not only all, also in Tigra. In a larger Oromia region, but really, we are the government to one way or another is at war uh, with, with the citizens. Uh, a lot of people are being killed, detained, uh, all kinds of things. So I think that is why an all inclusive, comprehensive national dialogue, dialogue is really needed. And as international community, including the, the big brothers, the US, the Britain, and the so on, uh, try to help us uh, to come to our senses and the work for the future. Thank you, Dr. Gadina. Uh, I have to admit I'm failing as a moderator, though. Uh, I've got to start enforcing uh, some time limits, but it's difficult when people are so thoughtful and intelligent who are speaking. Uh, but, um, uh, and I'm being selfish wanting to learn what you have to say, but I've got to, to uh, uh, impose a little more discipline on the, the time sequence so that other people can, uh, uh, can be engaged. But thank you very much, Dr. Kadina. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ibrahim uh, Aden, uh, do you want to give us uh, your perspective on the same question? Uh, uh, what do we do about the conflict in Tigray and, and uh, should, does it merit UN intervention? Uh, and maybe respond to uh, Dr. Godina's uh, perspective. Uh, Mr. Aden. Um, sure. Um... Thanks. Um, I, I do agree uh, several points that my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Murara uh, highlighted. Um, and this is, uh, you know, uh, the humanitarian uh, crisis, uh, the intervention of the humanitarian crisis. However, uh, when it comes to military uh, interventions, um, we don't feel an intervention uh, of uh, such an extent uh, will be the true solution here. Uh, we would rather advocate uh, that the international community use its good offices um, to bring all the uh, uh, concerned parties together in a genuine uh, dialogue uh, for, uh, I mean, for resolving this once and for all, uh, meaning a true dialogue uh, and negotiation uh, at the highest level, uh, including all the political parties, the elites, um, and the civil society in this case. A move that we were, uh, I mean, uh, a move that uh, is being denied uh, during the war between ONLF and the TPLF uh, uh, led Ethiopia, uh, when TPLF led uh, the, the wars uh, or committing genocide in Ogaden region, uh, this kind of move was never an option. And it's uh, regrettable that uh, those crimes were never intervened. And, and I hope uh, similar crises are not happening because at the end of the day, uh, one is, uh, what's going to suffer are the civilians, the innocent civilians. I mean, there's this thing that says, when two poles fight, the grass will suffer. So in this case, what's going to suffer the most are the civilians. Uh, and strongly, we have tested, uh, uh, you know, on the left, the, uh, the Ugarian people uh, in, the, uh, in the Somali region have seen uh, the true uh, meaning of genocide and they felt it. So we certainly not, do not encourage um, uh, such atrocities to continue. However, uh, I mean, inter military intervention might not be the true solution at this point. Uh, peace is certainly uh, beneficial for all stakeholders and we encourage peace. Uh, we believe that uh, negotiation would be good for parties. There are no winners in war. That's what we believe. There's no winners in war. Um, well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Somebody, Aiden. I, 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 have, I had somebody else talking, but I, I, I have a few couple uh, more highlights that I want to make. Go ahead. Go um, ahead. Uh, wars uh, and internal conflicts destroy states and people. Uh, generations are lost. The economic servers and emotions deepen. And even if one group wins, all we're doing is we're just planting the next conflict. That is, that's our position. Uh, the seeds of the next cycle of viol uh, violence are uh, certainly planted if one thinks that they won, uh, the, 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 they win the, 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 the fight. So war does not solve any, uh, any uh, 
it doesn't solve and it does not have any benefit to anybody. Unfortunately, by the time you realize uh, the cost of the war, it's already too late and it's already cost many lives. So uh, if ONLF believes in war, it would not have adopted a nonviolent strategy. As you know, in 19, uh, 2018, ONLF uh, signed a peace agreement with the federal government and we uh, started, we wanted to uh, move our agenda, political agendas, uh, in a nonviolent way to make sure that our people uh, get the rights and achieve uh, uh, and decide their political destiny through peaceful meaning. Um, okay, well, yeah. So uh, again, I know we are with the interest of time, uh, we, we really don't have much time left and I do respect uh, your, your, your time limitation here. But again, this is a great subject, a great topic that really needs to be addressed because this is the epicenter of the issue in Ethiopia or in the Horn of Africa, I should say, because I mean, certainly when one region in the Horn of Africa is not in peace, then the rest of the Horn of Africa is not going to be having or enjoying peace. So certainly a solution is needed. And my recommendation, and I strongly say this, my recommendation is dialogue, uh, a reconciliation, and if and if possible, and I think this is the solution because the, the country is at war at this point. There's an upcoming election. There's a lot of concerns that the election is might not be credible. There's already some uh, signs that we see in in many parts. For example, where I came from, the Somali, uh, the Ogaden region, there are already concerns that uh, the party in power at this point are already provoking and intimidating our supporters. I mean, they're limiting their, uh, uh, to exercise the assembly, uh, limiting the campaign uh, uh, mobilizations and all those kind of stuff, arresting uh, our, our leaders and officials, our supporters. As we speak today, we, uh, we have, uh, there are about over 50 ONLF officials and, uh, and supporters who are in jail today, simply because we were doing our campaign. Uh, we were mobilizing our people. We were educating the peaceful, the means of, uh, of, of you know, involving and, and taking part in the election. But our offices, 40 of our offices in Orahai region is being shut down. Uh, Jara region, they've been closed uh, in Warde region. So the, the party in power uh, in the Somali region is taking some measures that are very negative, very negative. And uh, you know, if this continues, we're extremely concerned whether uh, the situation is going to be. And we warn all those, uh, you know, imminent threats that has, that we've seen already, and the signs are already there. I hope the the government is going to uh, intervene. The I mean, the federal government is going to intervene and making sure that they honor uh, the, the the code of conduct of all the political parties sign, making sure that all political parties are free. Uh, I mean, uh, and, and allowed the space to exercise their political agendas and sell. Their, uh, their, their their policies to the to the people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. Uh, I call you by your first name. Uh, as I, uh, uh, my uh, your colleague, uh, because you shared so much with us, uh, we feel comfortable talking with you. Uh, and you're quite right. Uh, uh, both of you have emphasized how important. This question is, how do we deal with Tigray? And the, the conflict and then the current intervention, it was initiated uh, by an alleged unprovoked attack on the Northern Command, uh, but it really is a, um, an existential uh, challenge to uh, Abiy Ahmed's uh, uh, the, the rule. So there are two other questions though, very important questions. Uh, what are we going to do about the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam? It affects Sudan, Egypt uh, in a major way, um, but it, is, it seems to be central to Ethiopia's economic future. And then, of course, there's the issue that we in the United States and, and really Europe as well, because we finally we have a president who understands that when uh, European leaders and American, the, the American leadership agree, as uh, and I include Canada as well, that we ought to work in unison. Uh, and, and so uh, should there be any kind of multilateral uh, engagement greater than we have today? 
uh, and uh, in fact, we we had a very good question posed by Ambassador Michael Battle. Uh, he was the U.S. ambassador to the African Union and the U.S. representative to the United Nations Economic Commission on Africa under President Obama, and uh, uh, and he asks about the uh, the Grand Ethiopian Re Renaissance Dam and and, uh, and the extent to which the the parties, of course, are going to be able to work together. But we've now all been treated to the steak and potatoes, if you will, or, or a, 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 the, the comparable Ethiopian dish, uh, which I actually enjoy more than steak and potatoes when I have the opportunity to uh, consume Ethiopian food uh, in my favorite Ethiopian restaurants. Uh, but now we move to the dessert. Now we understand that dessert is usually smaller, uh, but it's oftentimes sweeter. I happen to have a sweet tooth. Uh, and it kind of leaves the lasting memory uh, when we leave the table. So we're not going to bring in uh, uh, Ms. Sina Jimjimo and uh, Ms. Hoda Duala uh, into the discussion. Uh, and uh, I, I'd like to be able to open it up further. I'm going to uh, uh, watch uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Michael Stopford to see whether he wants to, uh, uh, to widen it further. But... It's now your opportunity. I'm going to turn first to uh, Ms. Duwala uh, to ask uh, a question. And I, I want it to be a, a, a real uh, sizzler, you know, uh, 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 make it tough and, and concise. Uh, but um, uh, uh, tell us what's been on your mind as you've been listening to this discussion, Ms. Duwala. And then I'm going to turn to Ms. Jimjino. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, I would like to thank the organizers and the moderator, Honorable Jim Moran, for inviting me to participate in this crucial and much needed um, discussion. Um, since I have 10 minutes, I will move on to my first um, question. And to give a little bit background, since 1991, Ethiopia has had a regular elect direct, uh, elections but none has offered most Ethiopians a meaningful choice. In 2010, after the nation's election, the New York-based Human Rights Watch criticized the election as being corrupt by pre-elected irregularities. And this is because Ethiopia in all its existence never achieved a fair and transparent election. This is because from, the incep from its inceptions, these were held as the truth. Abyssinia are the true custodians of Ethiopia and everyone else are their subordinates. And secondly, the ruler and the ruled always believe that the government own the people and it is the nature of Ethiopia. The victor defines the rule, actors, resources and strategies of politics where human rights, um, natural resources, businesses and government uh, positions are only available to the ruling elite. And now in Ogedi region, as my colleague Ibrahim Adam stated, that under the interim um, president, Mustafa Omar, he has closed more than 45 Onolaf campaign offices in Qurrahe province, arrested more than 50 Onolaf officials in the, uh, to intimidate, derail, and discourage voters and to hinder the election process. Um, and my first question um, has two parts, and it's um, to Mr. Um, Marina, Dr. Marina Godina. I apologize if I pronounced it, um, mispronounced it. Uh, based on your experience, what role do you think the U.S. should play in assuring free and fair election in the upcoming um, election? And second part is, do you think the Congress should send election monitors to monitor the election? Good questions. And then we'll turn to uh, Ms. Jimjimo. Uh, Dr. Godina, you need to get off uh, your mute. Perhaps uh, should we turn to Mr. Aiden, and then we'll turn to Dr. Godina. Uh, well, you, because you're on mute now, I think, Doctor. Uh, Mr. Aiden, and then if that's okay, 
Ms. Duala? Yes, that's okay. okay. Uh, Mr. Aiden and then Dr. Godina. Great, thanks. Um, thanks, uh, Hodan. Uh, th those are powerful and great questions. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, I, I do uh, believe that um, what you have said uh, is exactly true. It's happening. Uh, the intimidation is going on right now. It's a uh, fact that it's happening on the ground. Unfortunately, we have not anticipated, we have not hoped those kind of intimid intimidation will affect or impact, or impact, I should say, uh, the upcoming election, but it, uh, we've been hoping that, uh, you know, uh, at this time, uh, more civilized uh, election is going to happen, uh, just like the rest of the world uh, in the democratic countries. But unfortunately, yes, as you said, in Korai region, uh, a lot of uh, ONLF supporters are in jail as we speak today. Uh, our offices have been closed in Jara region, in Korai and in Warder. And, and that's all happening simply because an intimidation, uh, uh, the current uh, uh, administration in the region knows that uh, ONLF uh, have the vast majority support of the people in the Somali region. Uh, and they know that uh, with landslide, I mean, ONLF will win the election. So before that happens, they're trying to uh, technically uh, intimidate the supporters. Uh, so uh, to your question, I do uh, extremely encourage uh, the U.S. government, uh, the Serbian federal government, the international partners to intervene the situation. This is, uh, Ethiopia is at crucial moment. This is, uh, Ethiopia is at crossroad, I should say. I mean, this is the only hope, and I think it's the last hope, I hope it's not. But uh, if Ethiopia uh, does not conduct free and fair election at this time, I don't know what the future of Ethiopia is going to look like. It's, I'm extremely concerned uh, because this is an imminent threat that's facing. And we already see the symptoms. We already see the signs, the warning signs that people who are exercising the God-given rights of free of assembly uh, are being detained, intimidated, all because of political gains to subjugate, to, uh, to scare the people so that uh, they, um, either not vote for ONLF or in other words, they in favor of uh, vote for, uh, for, for, the, uh, for the party in power at this point. So yes, I totally agree. Uh, US, uh, the rest of the world, and even the current federal administration need to inter intervene in this situation because people had hopes when Dr. B took in power, came in power. Uh, his, uh, the way he started his political agenda was extremely welcoming. It was favorable. Uh, people liked it, but uh, the science that we see right now is extremely, extremely concerning. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Aiden. Uh, uh, Dr. Godina, would you like to uh, take a couple minutes to uh, respond to that? Uh, Dr. Godina, you've got to take a go off mute. We're anxious to hear you, but you're on mute. Yeah. There okay. You go. Yeah, but you know, the election in Ethiopia really, since the last days of the emperor, we had several elections, too many elections probably. None of them except the, the 2005 elections relatively free, fair, and so on. You know, in fact, to sum up very clearly, uh, I remember Joseph Stalin used to say that to the people of Russia, you vote week out. That is a game. Yeah. Uh, he used to say, uh, you vote week out. I think the Turban government uh, leaders, uh, people voted the way they wanted and uh, the government counted the way it wanted, the way it makes to stay in power. Uh, the problem now is, as uh, my colleague said, we are at the political dead end and are very, at a very cri critical crossroad, very critical crossroad, which, <laughs> where we, we are not sure. I think the problem is, worsening in two areas. One is the military security structure. Second, the election board. The election board is very fast losing our confidence. It was uh, nominated by the prime minister. I remember I asked the prime minister to write reservation for me when he was creating or created this uh, present election board. And uh, the list, they are sending list to us to comment uh, this election officers uh, throughout the country. The, the least we got really 
some of them unemployed, some of them uh, electricians, some of them, uh, you, you know, even servants, we, Iran boys, some of them, whatever. Even we don't know, we don't know them, where they, who they are uh, in the sort. So I think both the election board, the ruling party, and it is a military security structure, including uh, uh, the court and whatever, I, they are working to frustrate and to ensure that the election is won by the present so-called ruling party. That's the problem. They are working. We, we, we see with our own eyes. For example, today they, they, uh, they did have rallies across Romania, forced rallies across Romania, but they deny us to conduct any rally, any larger public meeting. Uh, for example, four th about four things should be resolved. Otherwise, we, we could be maneuvered. The major parties, including the OLF, but this is the Oromia region, I know. And um, our group is probably can be maneuvered out of the election. One is the question of free movement for our supporters and the members. Two, we have, as you said, hundreds of elections, clo offices closed, hundreds of offices closed. And not less than 100 something. Three, including high profile political presidents uh, are now in prison, including part of the leadership. Um, in a lot, in lot of areas, they are in prison. Um, and then the question of the election board. The way the election board is sending, assigning um, people who, whom the local population, and the, the political groups competing in the area. Uh, who, we don't know them. They are simply no, sending no nitties. Uh, people, thank, thank some of them from the street. Doctor. Yeah, so really we can't be maneuvered out of the, of the election, whatever. And um, incidentally, I'm part of uh, the political parties uh, committee, including the government, we are about political, 50 political parties. This is what we are raising. Please make sure that this national dialogue, dialogue is true. Uh, at least we complete it. And then make sure that the major issues surrounding the elections are resolved. Otherwise, some of them can really push out of the election. And as a, probably the, the ruling party can continue to rule us in the old Ethiopia ways. What type of conflict the candidate is going to, it is going to bring? What type of crisis? What type of, uh, you know, mess up in, in Ethiopia and so on? We don't know. Uh, one thing is clear. If the hope for democratic election, the hope for democratic election is not going to be, not going to be one way or another, agreed upon, in, in during the pre-election days, during the election days, during the post-election days, election days, on the question of acceptance, I see darker days and a probably more conflict in Ethiopia. Thank you, Dr. Padita. Now we're going to turn to uh, Ms. Jimjimo. Uh, you've had a lot of time to put your question uh, together. Uh, I, I trust it's gonna be a real singer. Uh, Ms. Jimjimo, and uh, we very much appreciate uh, 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 you and, uh, and Ms. Duale uh, joining us. So, uh, Ms. Jimjimo, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Honorable Former Congressman Jim, panelists, and my colleague, Hoden. Since we have the ears of attention from important folks, from White House to ambassadors and families and journalists, I would like to take this opportunity to say or to make a few facts about Ethiopia or the reality in Ethiopia about the, the silent world happening in Oromia and elsewhere in Ethiopia. More importantly, I want to draw your attention to the silence of Ethiopian media that failed to report where nonviolent human rights activists and key opposition uh, party leader like Jawar Mohammed, Bakala Gerba, and others are on hunger strike, on day six hunger strike, and some of them are unconscious. I must tell you, I feel hopeful for the first time as a Romo and probably Somali, we are not being blamed for the war in Ethiopia. 
Yet my deepest condolence goes out to my brothers and sisters being massacred in Tigray region for committing no crime, but for being Tigray. If a crime that we as a Romo have used to it or grow up to it, it was a crime to be on a Romo under TPLF and before that too. Um, my question for these two gentlemen are uh, as follows, but before that, I would like to make a few statements more. As a diaspora who been in America for nearly 20 plus years, and we've been protesting and we are tired of protesting. We really like to see change. In 2018, I represent an organization to which I testified to Congress, paving the way for change, Abby to lead. Abby, who came to America to greet us and apologize for the terror they inflicted on into millions of Ethiopian people, especially Oromo, as a, as a threat to TPLF power at the time and now a threat to the PP power. However, today we are here to ask a few questions, uh, the gentlemen who are speaking. Uh, my, my two questions are, hopefully I'll just ask maybe the first uh, question, which has a sub-question. The national election of Ethiopia, which is Nebe, was established uh, by proclamation number 64, 1992, and uh, as an independent organization. According to article of the amendment or proclamation uh, number 532 of 2000, the Nebi consists of uh, nine members who are nominated by prime minister and appo appointed by House of Representatives. In theory, Nebi is this an independent body organization that's supposed to run fair and free election. However, recently, several opposition parties are suing Nebi. And Dr. Marara, you have indicated concern during media interview, including for lack of coverage from state media, uh, as well as your uh, members are being in prison. Do you think or does your party have confidence Nebi could run a free and fair election? And just a sub-question to that is, according to Nebi, any party or anyone running for election, they must fulfill certain requirements. Among those requirements is parties must have general assembly to elect official of officers, such as you know, chair and vice chair, have a central committee, hold assembly to uh, stratify its constitution before the, the Nebi can approve uh, an organization or a, a party as a party. And the EPDRF, the four was the main uh, four party, the uh, TPLF uh, or PDO, and the other two. Do you think a prosperity party, the AB, which uh, the party that AB runs, have qualified um, to be as a party? These are my question, and then if I have a chance, I'll come back to the second question. I'll write, those are the same question for both. Thank you. Darn it! I have to say. Uh, I've been, uh, I failed as your moderator because we were supposed to conclude about noontime. So Mr. Stopford is gonna interrupt us uh, just when we've uh, really got some singers going here. Uh, uh, maybe uh, Michael, we could get some really quick responses because they're very good questions. And this Jim Gimo obviously has done a good deal of research. Could we get a quick response? From this both, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that would be fine. You know, Jim, I'm, I'm not really the one controlling the time on this. I think that's possibly Charles, if you're still there. So yeah. from my point of view, it's fine. Um, okay. Unless so anybody cuts off, why, didn't, why didn't we do that? Thank you. I, okay, then uh, I, until I hear from Charles, Bill. let's let's go Bill. with uh, getting some questions from those uh, very good, Bill. getting some answers from that very good question. This is this is this is Dr. Von Balti. Feel oh. free to go. We can have an, a ten more ten more minutes extension here. So feel free to continue. Thank you very much, Mr. Von Balti. Thank you, uh, Dr. Godina. And it's going to have to be a very concise I think I did. response in, in deference to everyone else. Yeah, I mean, even I did I did not hear what uh, Sena said so I only heard about the election board. I think this election board uh, from the beginning um, it is it is uh, nomination was compromised and it was a uh, uh, really the, the work of the prime minister who nominated all of them. Uh, even uh, on that day uh, I made sure that uh, to get written down uh, I asked him my own reservation. Uh, since then they, in fact they proved me right. Uh, because the election board is really uh, compromised, in the, uh, it is uh, more or less. Uh, in fact, in front of her last time we had uh, we, a meeting last week, I told her uh, 
you are worried than uh, the old uh, election board officials uh, in Hungary. For example, uh, they she never tried uh, to get at least to get the release of uh, our prisoners, the opening of our offices. She simply uh, uh, trying to put the schedule after the schedule. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, probably for one, two part, one or two parties whom uh, we expect uh, she's working. So really, uh, at least our parties, the oil and others with whom we have contact, we are losing, really losing confidence in the present election board. And the, probably what, this is one of the issues we are going to uh, uh, negotiate with the government if the national dialogue is going to come, the, especially the way they are restructuring in the, uh, there are offices in the regions, in the whatever. It is shocking, even for worries. At least the old, uh, in the old games, they know what they do, what they do and what, uh, whatever. They were thieves, they were stealing our reports, but uh, they at least know what the election means in the soul. The present one really, I don't know from where they are collecting. Uh, okay, I, th I think we've made that the point, Dr. Thank you very much, Dr. Godino. Okay. Mr. Aiden, do you want to give a quick response as well? Sure. Uh, thanks. This is a great uh, point that uh, Sister um, uh, raised. So certainly uh, what I would like to highlight here is uh, NEPE, um, the election board uh, chair and the team. Uh, however they were elected and how they were appointed, we know it. I mean, yes, they were appointed. However, the hopes of the people, there are a lot of hopes that people are expecting from them. Uh, so what I would urge Nebe is to take a position that is going to help the people in, in, in terms of election. Uh, the other point that she raised was uh, the convention for the parties. I mean, yes, I think every political party must have a convention to elect their leaders. Uh, as, as far as we know, there are some parties who did not uh, conduct their conventions and still they are in the, in the, in the, in the, in the contest. Um, ONLF in 2019, uh, 2019, November, yes, we had a convention uh, in Gode and we have elected our, our leaders there. It was transparent. I mean, uh, everybody was watching live how we elected. Yet, uh, a point that NEPE and the federal government needs to know is that there is a lot of interference that's coming from the uh, administration in, 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 in Somali region uh, led by Mustafa Omar a direct interference, uh, violating the code of conduct by interfering the internal affairs of ONLF, dividing the ONLF, unfortunately. This is very sure. sad. That, that's an important point to bring out. Thank you, Mr. Aiden. I'm gonna now ask all four panelists for one quick statement you want to leave with the, uh, the entire audience. Tell us what we need to know as, as, as succinctly as possible. Uh, so I'll, I'll start where we uh, concluded with Ms. Jim Gimo. Tell us something we need to know. Thank you, uh, Honorable, but uh, I'll take you by surprise, but I think um, this is an opportunity of lifetime. Uh, the people of Ethiopia are already are tired of, you know, uh, same old system. The U.S. government have an opportunity. The Biden administration have a great opportunity uh, to really um, shape the Horn of Africa, particularly Ethiopia, as a regional key player with the population of 110 or million. That the U.S. should really look into this concern from opposition party. The mass arrest, the election cannot be an answer where there is mass incarceration of a political prisoner, where the media is not fair, where the Navy, the election board, is suspected of working with the government. So I think the U.S. government have really the opportunity to pursue that. Thank you. Good for you. Thank you very much, Ms. Jim Gimo, and and that was concise as well, Ms. Duala. Um. Thank you so much. I would like to state that under Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, the rule of law has been the central focus in the administration. However, it lacks the capacity to conduct preliminary oversight of the 10 regional administration. Recently, under the direct and control of Mustafa Amar in the Ogaden region, human rights atrocities are being committed against the people of the region. Um, officials, political oppositions are being arrested. Entire villages are being burned to the ground. The most recent 
village burned was last week uh, in Hab Habawene, uh, which uh, burned to ashes um, along with its livestock. People are being forced um, and to migrate and, and forcefully. And this, if it continues, there is no doubt that the Ogaden region will face the similar atrocity that were committed by the TBLF. And I believe that the, um, and the international community and specifically the United States should intercede by using US aid as a stipulation to uphold human rights and that we should not uh, provide aid blindly and that we should place mechanism in, 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 in we should place mechanism that should uh, monitor humanitarian aids and that humanitarian aid should not be invested in military expansion. Um, that is all I'm going to say. Very well, you said it very well. And it was very important to say, thank you so much, Ms. Duvala. Uh, Marira, Dr. Marira Gradina. I think quickly, we have- What state? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, we have really two big issues. Uh, the massive violations of human rights in Ethiopia across across Ethiopia, not only limited to Tigray. That should be stopped. That should be stopped. Two, uh, really, the, the national dialogue, we have been calling for three years, not three weeks or three months, three years. And, uh, should really one way or another, uh, should be in place. And I think the international committee, especially the big brothers, I repeat it, especially the big brothers, choose whatever donors leverage they have uh, to push the Ethiopian government to make sure that the national dialogue is in place, in place and the coming elections should be free, fair, and credible for, for the future of Ethiopia, even for the ruling party and for all of us. Uh, that sure. is where you should really uh, able to involve uh, to make a difference, a real difference. Thank Otherwise, you, the, the, the ruling party could, could continue, you know, business as usual. It has been playing that game uh, in the past. Um, the free formula ones also, as I told you, really refusing. Okay, that, that, but that's the, that's the statement we needed to hear. Thank you, Dr. Gadina and, and Mr. Aiden. And this um, will be the last word. Yeah, thanks. I'll be precise to the point. Um, yes, um, again, as I said, Ethiopia is at crossroad high hopes in the election. But before uh, I should rush my conclusion to the election is uh, the way uh, NEPE is rushing the schedule of the election and the concerns that we see on the ground. I mean, uh, uh, the stakeholders are extremely concerned, political parties are extremely disappointed how things are going. My advice is, I mean, get the government postponed when the election was due last year. However, for whatever reason, however, currently, now that we've seen this, the signs that's showing us if this election is held the way it's going right now, it will be incredible, it will be uh, unfair, it will be not free. I think my advice is the government need to think, they have to call uh, a national dialogue, uh, dialogue uh, or negotiation to uh, work on uh, an inclusive interim government that includes all the party uh, for the next, one or two years to ensure that those, the interim government, the inclusive interim government, I should say this, I have to be very clear, inclusive interim government that can reach this country, uh, a point where they can do free and fair election. But the situation as there is today, it's very concerning. And I think the outcome is not going to uh, make us happy or make the world happy. It will be quite disappointing the way it looks like. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ibrahim. Uh, Mr. Ibrahim Aiden. <laughs> I'll just pronounce it once more. Uh, very good. Uh, and that's where you began and that's where we're ending. We need inclusive dialogue. We need full participation of all of the entities that make up the great nation of Ethiopia. I'm now gonna turn over to uh, Charles Blazovich and uh, Mr. Michael Stopford. Thank you all. This has been a delight. I love to learn from people who know what they're talking about and all of the points you've made have been uh, very worthwhile to uh, uh, to have shared with our audience. We thank all of the participants very much. Charles. Jim, thank you so much. Um, and to everyone who's joined us today, you know, on behalf of uh, Von Batten Montague, York, 
we just so appreciate you taking the time uh, to join us and especially to uh, Honorable Jim Moran for moderating the panel. Uh, we'd also like to thank our panelists, um, Dr. Kudina, uh, Mr. Aiden, um, Ms. Duala, and uh, Ms. Jimjimo uh, for an in-depth and very informative discussion. Um, uh, as I mentioned at the outset of this afternoon, uh, this, re this entire presentation has been recorded um, and will be available on the Ethiopian Forum website, uh, www.theethiopianforum.com. Uh, as another note, uh, a white paper will be produced coming out of this conversation um, and uh, made available for distribution, uh, both to all of you as well as to uh, the federal government here in the US um, and other key players in this. Um, we are excited to note uh, there will be a secondary panel discussion in this forum series. Uh, we, it is currently scheduled for Tuesday, March 2nd. Uh, we will be sharing those details as soon as they are available, but we do hope that you're all able to join us for that. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset, you know, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this does conclude the uh, first panel. Charles, can I just can I just say as a last word, Charles, that um, yes. I, I, I think um, you, everybody did a tremendous job today, and I just like to say thank you to Congressman Jim Moran because I think your 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 moderation, Jim, was not only excellent; it's truly empathetic, and uh, we really appreciate your your role here. So thank you from all of us. You make me feel like a million bucks, uh, Michael. Thank you so much. I hope when things get back to normal. We can sit down and have a drink together. I'd love that. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, Wonderful. Thank you. well, I know that sentiment is shared by all, but thank you again, for everyone, for joining us today. Uh, this does conclude the first panel of the 2021 Ethiopian Forum. Uh, best wishes and um, Godspeed. Thank, thank you again. All. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, too. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.